High Life Group leaders, uh, Bible scholars of great esteem, uh, I'm Ken Gaines and I'm going to be talking about our lesson for this week. Um, it comes out of 1 Kings chapter 11, the first 13 verses, and it's entitled Compromised, which is a great title um, for a great theme in, in, in the lesson we have today. Um, so Solomon's cast in a fairly glowing light in the first 10 chapters of this record. Um, but then in chapter 11, uh, there's a stark contrasting turn that happens. And Solomon begins to split his loyalty between God and something that he desires greatly, um, his wife's wishes. And so that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, you know, we've just come through some of the chapters where they've talked about his great wisdom and, um, you know, people from all over are coming to see him, uh, kings and queens, royalty, uh, to see the great things he's accomplished and to hear what he has to say. Uh, so Solomon's at the top of his game, but it's going to start crumbling rather quickly uh, because of some mistakes that he um made uh, a couple of lessons ago early early in the book uh, i kind of broke this down into four sections uh, the first one i entitled sin uh, and that's uh, verses one through three and what sin is is just disobeying god that's the definition of it uh, so we saw signs of this in chapter three when Solomon took the Egyptian princess for his wife. Um, in chapter 11, we're told that Solomon took many wives from their supposed enemies all around them, um, 700 princess wives and 300 concubines. Um, so Solomon was very wise in some areas, not so wise in other areas. And so <laughs> uh, I think many of you would agree with me on that. Um, but anyway, he, he did this for a variety of reasons. You know, I'm sure in his mind he justified this as a way to keep the peace. Um, but clearly he knew it was wrong. And, um, you know, he was not exempt from God's decree just because he was king. However, he may have thought so. Um, again, with all of his wisdom, with all of his fame, with all of his fortune, we know what happens to people, you know, in modern day when that happens to them. Uh, they quickly forget that uh, the same life rules that apply to the rest of us also apply to them. Um, so uh, he probably also justified it because the Bible says he deeply loved them says he cared for them, and, and, and he likely improved their lives uh, substantially from a worldview. Um, e even though they were princesses, uh, Solomon, we know, was the wealthiest person on the planet, and uh, it, his wealth just continued to flourish. And so I'm sure these ladies led wonderful lives, walking around his palace and uh, enjoying the food and the clothes and jewelry and everything that he could offer them. Um, but we must remember that the definition of sin is not doing what's right uh, or doing what's wrong. It's, it's disobeying God. It doesn't matter what we think is right or wrong. And, and many times we forget that. And um, you might talk to your class um, about other examples in the Bible where this has happened, or maybe even in current events where, you know, people think, well, I'm doing the right thing here, even though it's really sin. Um, and uh, how easy would it have been for Solomon to trick himself into thinking that he was protecting God's people by making these unions? And I'm sure that that's what he thought. Um, you know, these, uh, even though God had promised peace, with David and made this covenant uh, and we'll talk about in a minute you know where all of these women came from and, and um, but um, you know Solomon it would have been pretty easy for him to think I'm doing the right thing I'm doing this for an unselfish reason even though he was really doing it for a selfish reason uh, 
Um, you know, I'm protecting God's people. I'm protecting Israel by making all of these unions. Um, but, you know, I, it says that he cared about them, but, you know, if he really cared about them, why did he not try to convert these women um, to worshiping the one and true God? I don't think Solomon ever lost sight that God was the one and true God. Um, however, he did some foolish things which made it appear that he didn't believe that. Um, so why he would do that in front of his wives and concubines that he supposedly cared about, it would be a good question or topic to talk about in your class. So the second section that uh, I kind of put together was verses 4 through 8. And I titled that Compromise, Splitting Time with God. And so apparently Solomon kept his loyalty to God for some time, even though he had all these wives and concubines and allowed them to continue to worship their various deities. Um, he evidently did not participate in that very much, if at all, until he got older. And as he got older, he soon began to worship these other deities with them, it tells us. Um, his wives and concubines had continued to worship them all along, uh, and he allowed this. He even built altars for several of them. Uh, verse 4 tells us Solomon was not wholeheartedly devoted to God by this time and contrast him with, with, who, with David, who was. Um, now, this is a great discussion with your class. Um, why this is so, even though David was an adulterer and a murderer because he was an adulterer. Neither sin uh, was committed by Solomon. You know, Solomon married all the women that he was with, and he didn't murder anyone, uh, at least up to this point that we know of. So, you know, but yet David was held in less punishment than Solomon was for this. And there's a couple of reasons why. One, David was very repentant about his sins. And Solomon, it does not appear, was so. As a matter of fact, he's falling deeper and deeper into this polytheistic worship. And so uh, that'd be a great discussion. You know, uh, how does that compare with how we rank sin today? Um, what we call sin and how God views it, Right. An adulterer and a murderer, we would rank as among the worst. And someone who just went down and worshipped at the uh, Muslim temple, we wouldn't think anything about. But basically, that's what Solomon was doing. And then you've got this murder and adulterer over here, yet God's going to punish this person over here much more so. And so that'd be a really good discussion um, to keep us on track with how we view sin, how we view what God values, uh, and therefore what we should value. Um, and um, repentance is a big deal um, in the Bible. So um, sin is a big deal as well, but repentance, um, you know, not only shows reverence to God, but also helps us uh, bringing us back to him. That's what David did. Solomon was not doing that. So even though his sin may seem like a much lesser sin to us, uh, God didn't view it that way, and he's going to talk to us about that. Um, the next section that I put down was kind of these pagan deities. Uh, uh, you know, you could spend all class talking about these. I, I would advise you not to do that because that's not really the lesson. But, um, you know, talking about what did Solomon worship? especially in light of the fact that he knew there was one true God, and yet he did this anyway. So it's, uh, again, he just wanted to fit in culturally. Uh, we'll talk about that in, uh, here at the end of this section here. This is verses 4 through 8 as well. Um, the first God here is Ashtoreth, uh, the goddess of the Sidonians. Um, the inhabitants of Sidon were pagans descended from Canaan. Uh, we'll learn in chapter 16, this is where Jezebel was born. Uh, all kinds of trouble come from this region. And Solomon is trying uh, to make unions and uh, political uh, partnerships here. 
which, you know, it's just not going to work out. Um, another pagan deity is mentioned is Milcom, uh, the god of the Ammonites, sometimes called Molech. Uh, the Ammonites were descendants of Ammon, one of Lot's sons by one of his daughters, not to be confused with the Amorites, which was another group of people. Uh, so even though they were closely related uh, to the Israelites, they would be enemies, and they would cause havoc for them many times throughout history. Uh, and so this, these are the kind of people that Solomon is trying to have peace with in a way that God did not approve of. Um, Chemosh was another one, God of the Moabites. Uh, these were descendants of Moab who was also Lot's son by his other daughter. And they fought with the Israelites all the time. So, I mean, Solomon couldn't have picked the worst of the worst uh, uh, to pull wives out of. Um, but uh, this is what he did. And, and again, he's justifying this through all kinds of means uh, in his own mind. Uh, Edomites, descendants of Esau, and Hittites, and some other descendants of Canaan are also mentioned. Uh, both these groups worshipped a variety of gods related to nature, to war, um, other areas of life. Um, in verse 8, it says, Solomon built many altars for all his wives, regardless of their religious affiliation. And so uh, if you look on a map, um, you look at this time frame and when where all these uh, countries were I mean they completely surround Israel and uh, so again you know you take Egypt and you throw Egypt in there to the south uh, you know Sidon over to the west and and uh, some of these other Moab to the west or to the east I mean and so you know they completely surround Israel and so Solomon has no hope once he started these political partnerships to just continue that uh, and whoever comes after him his son's going to have to continue that you know for it to continue to hold instead of trusting and leaning on God and so that's another lesson for us many times we do that right we try to make things right and justify our actions because we're saying hey we're doing a good thing uh, for ourselves or for other people uh, but if it goes against God's will, if it goes against God's word, then it's never going to work out for us, and, and it's not going to for Solomon here. Um, I'm sure at this point, you know, because for a long time he didn't do this, and it says as he got older he started doing this, I'm sure he's just trying to keep the peace. And he's justifying in his mind uh, what, what he knew was sin, but, you know, he loves his wives, he's trying to make them happy, uh, how in the world he thought this was ever going to work out with a thousand of them, <laughs> you know, I don't know. But anyway, um, you know, he, he's doing this. And another thing, uh, it would be highly likely that most of these wives would actually go and worship the true God, our God, with Solomon because they were very polytheistic in their belief um, ideology. And so it would be nothing for them to go worship, you know, the true God, because to them they would just consider that as one more God. And so it might be that now uh, Solomon's being made to feel guilty about not reciprocating and going and worshiping with them. And uh, even though he knows it's wrong, um, he is bowing to that to make them happy, um, to show them that he cares about them. But again, uh, the definitions of love, um, you know, sometimes we, we get that wrong. And uh, certainly unbelievers don't understand God's love because it doesn't always mean just doing whatever makes you feel good or whatever keeps the peace. It has to be within God's word or it's not going to work out well. Uh, the last section here um, I entitled God's Response, Discipline but Covenant Upheld. Uh, and this is verses 9 through 13. So in verse 9 shows us that God's response to all of this was not a good one, um, as you can expect. Uh, because Solomon had not wholeheartedly given his heart to the Lord, God is angry. Uh, so you might discuss for a little bit um, that uh, verse, you know, you might discuss uh, 
God's angry here, but it's not a sin because God can't sin. So how does that reconcile with the rest of the word? So it clearly says God's angry with him. Uh, and, and we tend to, you know, associate anger with being sin, you know, being a sin. Uh, but it's not here, so uh, there's a righteous anger, and, and then that that's not. Um, so that would be a great discussion to have. Um, but God's angry because he appeared to Solomon not once, but twice to remind him to walk in the ways of David. Uh, and this was in chapter 3, verse 14, and then in chapter 9, specifically in verse 4, um, this, the second time, you know, that he warns him, he specifically warns him about worshiping other gods. I mean, just flat out. Now, I think there's a little bit of time that's happened between that and when we're, we're studying now, but still, he specifically addressed this with Solomon, and Solomon's going and doing it anyway. Um, again, uh, Solomon is just trying to make everyone feel appeased, and uh, that's not what he's supposed to do, especially in the position of being king uh, that he is in. Uh, we see God's omniscience here, though. Second um, Samuel chapter seven, twelve through fifteen. You know, God says Solomon will rule; he will commit iniquity, and he will be disciplined with the stripes of men. But God's love will never depart from him, as it did Saul. Um, we know that Solomon loved God. We know that Solomon didn't really believe in these false gods. Uh, and uh, yet he still disobeyed God uh, in trying to appease his wives. And so he's, he's got to be punished for that. Uh, the discipline is going to be that the Israelite kingdom is going to be ripped to pieces by their enemies. And uh, at first glance... You know, we might look at verse 12. It says, Yet for the sake of David your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. At first, this may seem like it's a comfort from God to Solomon. Say, hey, I'm, I'm not going to do it when, while you're reigning. But he's going to do it when his son's on the throne. So what looks like, what may look like a comfort, really put yourself in Solomon's place. Um and discuss, you know, how he must have felt when he heard that proclamation and realized what he had done. I think uh, any one of us as parents would certainly take punishment for our children, especially if it was unjust. And yet this is what God's going to do. And, and we see it as unjust, but this is justice from God in that he is going to allow something to happen to Solomon's offspring because of what Solomon did. And, and um, you know, that's a, a great topic to talk about if you have time left at, at the end um, of what legacies really mean and how our lives impact those around us and those that go after us, uh, regardless of whether we want them to or not. Uh, they're going to. And so... Um, you know, just the gravity of that uh, as you make life decisions and uh, try to pour into um, the generation that's coming after you, um, that it really makes a big difference. God says so right here, and God says, I, I make some of that happen. Um, in verse 13, God promises to leave one tribe intact, though. We know that that tribe is Judah. And um, this is also part of the covenant that God made with David. Uh, God has protected a remnant, and he will continue to do so until Jesus returns. Um, and it didn't have to end up this way. Uh, again, look at the devastation caused by David's sins and, uh, and Solomon's sins. Uh, so the theme that's running through this entire book is that our disobedience to God creates ripples that affect the generations um, after us, whether we want them to or not. Uh, so this life is about glorifying the one and only God. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's easy to say that, and it's, it's, uh, but it's hard to do because it's hard not to be sinful. It's hard not to be selfish and prideful. Uh, 
Um, but true peace and joy can never be had without focusing on him and him alone. And that's, that's really what I got out of the lesson. There's lots of good uh, points uh, of discussion to be had here. And so uh, I can't wait to hear what my class has to say about some of these things. And, and I know you guys are going to have a great class as well. So I hope this is helpful. Hope you have a great week. Stay out of the rain. And uh, we'll see you then.